is labels. So labels have a very specific structure. Um, you're going to be saying, it seems like, it sounds like, it looks like, it feels like. You can use it or you can use you. It is neutral. It's where you should probably stay when you're starting to use the skills because it is neutral. You can use you and it's, it's definitely more engaging, but if you're not really very careful about the tone of voice that you have, using you cannot go very well for you if you're not careful. So you can say, it seems like you're angry, or you can say, you seem angry. The you that I just said was very accusatory. People don't respond well to that. So it's better if you just stick with it in the beginning until you're dealing with somebody who you know for sure feels a certain way and you can say it without that little sarcastic kind of accusatory tone in your voice. Now, when you're using labels, actually, I don't know why we just have this on the label slide because it's using any of our skills. Do not use the word, but after you say something because it is an erasing word. So everything you say after the word, but erases everything you said before it. So if you say, you know, um, you seem angry, but you really don't need to be. You just erase that perfectly good label by, erase, by, by saying the word, but. If you use the words and or because, you're actually either explaining the label or you're stepping on it. So what you need to do instead of actually putting one of those words in there after you use a really good label or even after a mirror, you wanna just go quiet, okay? Let, it, let the person process what you just said. Don't erase it or explain it right away. One thing I want you to remember through this process is if you are explaining, you're losing. Okay, so when you use our skills, you don't want to explain them. You want to like drop them. It's like dropping the mic. You just put it out there and let it sit. Okay. So what exactly are labels? So labels are essentially verbal observations. They are whatever you're seeing or picking up from the other side. So it could be their motivations, the circumstances that they're in, the dynamics of the situation that you're both involved in. It could be their emotions. It's you interpreting. So when you're using a label, you can do what we call a surface label, which is what's presenting. In other words, usually what's presenting when you're dealing with someone else is whatever emotion that they're feeling. Because a lot of times you can see it in their body language, you can see it or feel it in what they're saying. So um, if you label that surface element, it's not a bad thing to do, but it's better if you can use a deeper label, which is trying to maybe get to the why behind the behavior. So say you have a friend, who is arguing with their spouse. And so when you start talking to them, you say, it seems like you hate arguing with your spouse. And then their thought is, well, yeah, of course I hate arguing with my spouse. Who doesn't hate arguing with their spouse? That was a dumb thing to say. Instead of going for that surface label, which is not horrible, go for a deeper label and say something like, it seems like you get irritated when you and your spouse don't see eye to eye. It's just a little bit deeper. It doesn't take much, just a slight shift to get you from the very surface, you hate arguing with your spouse, to the deeper kind of why behind it. Seems like you get irritated when you and your spouse don't see eye to eye, okay? You can label negatives or you can label positives. If you label negatives, it actually diffuses them. Shh, I got off mochi. If you notice something negative that's happening in the room and you ignore it, it's like not pointing out the elephant that's right there that everybody knows is there, but no one's saying anything about it. And if you leave it there, it just tramples around everything. If you point it out, if you just go ahead and say, there's that elephant in the room, you're going to actually diffuse it. You're going to mitigate it. You're going to take away its power. So labeling the negative is not a bad thing. Um, I mean, you can talk about someone's emotion as being negative. You know, well, it really seems like you're angry. 
And if the anger is something that's, that's kind of clouding what's going on with you and your conversation, and you see that you can label that it actually just points it out, gets that negative out there and actually then diffuses it. One of the reasons it works so well is because you're demonstrating an understanding of the other side. Okay. You're letting them know that you see this negative thing and then you're helping them kind of diffuse it. You can label positives and that actually reinforces them. And this kind of goes along with, um, neuroscience, basically. If, if I, um, I'm dealing with my daughter and she goes out with her friends and she comes home and I realize that she's in a really, really good mood, I'm going to label that. I'm going to say, seems like you had a really good time with your friends. And what happens when I say that is she goes back to that point in time where she was out with her friends and she was having a really good time and it releases endorphins and gives her this little sense of euphoria so it's reinforcing that positive time that she had, and it's bringing up all these nice positive things. So when you're labeling that positive thing, it's actually reinforcing it. How are we doing, Troy? Good, good on questions or anything you want to bring up? Yeah, we're good on questions right now. No. Okay. Perfect. Okay, so it's kind of important for you to have what we call a go-to list of labels. This is going to help you be able to use the skills without having to think quite so hard about it, because when you first start using this stuff, it's kind of difficult to just think of something on the fly. So if you have three or four or five labels that you can kind of interchangeably use, a lot of them will be good in almost any situation and it'll help you practice because in order for you to actually form a new habit of using these skills, you have to get between 64 and 67 repetitions before you start paving that neural pathway that actually helps you use these without having to think about it. Okay, so it does take a lot of practice. So this go-to list um, has some of our favorite labels on it. One that's really, really good that you can use pretty much any time is it sounds like this is important to you. Another, it looks like you've given this a lot of thought. And here's the one that you use. If you're at an impasse with someone, you've reached a, a, a position in the conversation or negotiation where things just don't look like they're going to go forward very well or very easily or at all, you can say, it sounds like there's nothing I can do to change your mind. By saying that, you're opening the door for them to tell you if there is something you can do to change their mind, that's when they're going to let you know, okay? So if you feel like things are just like you hit a brick wall in this conversation, you can, you can throw that label out there and see what information they give you back to kind of give you an idea of where you can go or if you can go. So this next one is my favorite. Seems like you have a reason for and you can put a lot of different things in here, saying that, thinking that, feeling that, doing that. It's pretty much this um, all-encompassing label that you just stick the verb in there that you need, okay? One of my favorite things to, to use this for is if someone asks you a question that you're either not sure about answering, you don't know what the answer is, um, you don't want to answer it, any of those things, you can say, it seems like you have a reason for asking that. This is an important one because people really ask lousy questions and they do it for a couple of different reasons. One, because their brain works a little bit differently than yours and they feel like they're asking a great question, but to you, it doesn't make any sense or to you, it sends you to a different direction. So you start answering this question and you're explaining this answer for 10 or 20 minutes and they come back and basically say, that's not what I was asking. And then they ask you a different question, which is really what they more what they wanted to know. And then, then you can get to the real question, but now you've wasted 10, 15, 20 minutes answering the wrong thing that they really didn't want. So if you're ever unsure about the direction someone's trying to take you in by asking a question, or you're not really getting what they really want from the question, then you can just throw out there. It seems like you have a reason for asking that. And then they'll tell you the reason that they asked the question, and it'll basically tell you exactly where to go with what information they want. Okay. Good, Troy. Hey, Sandy, uh, Pete, yeah. you want to come up, Pete Brog? Broken. I don't know how to say your last name, Pete. I don't want to <laughs> Come ruin on up, it. Pete. <laughs> <laughs> I was scared. 
All right. Uh, there you go. Just Look, like I was going to say it. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that was it. <laughs> go ahead, Pete. Hey, thanks. This has been really awkward for me trying to label it, and I end up doing like the super obvious. And I feel like I end up sounding really stupid. But um, <laughs> when I'm trying to, like, uh, a lot of our work is remote and texting. Um, how do you try to do that in a text without explaining mm -hmm. or kind of continuing on with, with what you want to say? Good question. So, at the Black Swan Group, we don't like talking over email or text. And the reason is because you can't control the tone if you're using a text or an email. And tone is so important with using these skills because you can change the meaning of something that you're saying just by you know, modulating your tone of voice just a little bit. And even when you're texting, everyone says, well, yes, you can control, you know, the tone of a text, because if you use all capitals, it means you're yelling at someone. Okay. So the only thing you can express is that you're yelling at them. So what good does that do you if you're yelling at someone over text? So we encourage you to use a text or an email to push someone to a voice to voice conversation. Okay. That's, that's first of all, second of all, if you have to send an email, because I know some people have this, have a kind of job where that's how they communicate. Everything's back and forth on email. It's awful, but I understand that it happens because we, we hear that from a lot of people. So if you're gonna use an email, you should not be doing any more than three to five sentences because let's face it, how many of you like reading really long emails? No, but how many of you send really long emails? Go ahead, don't be, don't be shy, raise your hand. You know, you want to get all your stuff out. So you put it all in an email, but you know, when someone does that to you, you're like, Jesus, why did they send me this like 10 paragraph email? You don't want to read it. Problem is then you don't read it. You may read the first paragraph of every sentence. I mean, the first sentence of every paragraph, but you usually don't get that far. You read one paragraph, maybe somewhere into the second one, you catch on on one thing that you want to grip on out of that whole email. You miss the rest of it and you respond to that only. So you have to be careful communicating digitally because even though if you're looking at that slide right there, those black words on that white slide really don't have a tone. The problem is whoever is reading it is going to assign the tone to it, meaning you have no control. So the thing that I would suggest that you do is try to push them to a voice to voice conversation. If they won't do that, keep your answers short. Deal with one thing at a time. Because what happens then is people, people want to get this over with. They want to get the talk done. They want to resolve whatever it is they want to resolve. But if you're only giving them an answer or response to one issue in their 10 paragraph email at a time, they're going to realize this, it keeps going back and forth. They're going to get frustrated. So then when you give them what we call a no oriented question, would you be against us jumping on an eight minute phone call just to resolve this? They'll be so happy to do that because they're tired of the back and forth emails. It makes it easier. Okay. And then you get to control your tone. So it's much better. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, I